Hey there, good morning everybody. It is Monday, May the 3rd, 10 o'clock. Finally, I'm back on track and back on schedule, and we are picking it up where we left off yesterday, 1 Samuel, chapter number 12 today. So if you haven't been with us the last few days, we got to a place where the nation of Israel desired to have a king that ruled over them, and the only reason they wanted it is because all the other nations had kings. Now, up until this point, God was their king. He was their ruler and their leader, but no, they want a human being like the others have. And so God gave them a king, a man named Saul. Now he had told Samuel, this isn't a good idea. You need to tell the people that it's not a good idea. And Samuel said, yeah, I know it's not a good idea and I will tell them. And Samuel said, this isn't a good idea. And the people said, we don't care. We want it anyway. You know, you ever think about how many times we choose something for ourselves or we make a decision in our lives when we know that it's really not the best thing to do, but we do it anyways. And that's what's happening with the children of Israel here, making a choice that isn't for the best. So God gives them a king, they anoint him. And we read yesterday how uh, the first battle that Saul is involved with. They get the victory. So the people rally around him and uh, God had blessed that particular effort of Saul's. Now, today in chapter number 12, it's basically Samuel saying, I told you so. He knows better. He knows history. He knows what's going to happen in the future. And he told the people, you shouldn't have a king. They demanded one anyway. They got it. And now he's going to read them a riot act here. So this is an old man yelling at a bunch of people who wouldn't listen to him. And you know what? Rightfully so. You know, I, 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 I don't know, maybe it's because I'm an old man now, but I get tired of hearing young people complain about the lectures of the older people. Older people are just trying to help you out. That's why we lecture you the way that we do. Probably when I was young, though, I complained about it too. So I don't know. Let's get myself out of this pot of hot water I've put myself in by praying, shall we? Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for a good day in your house yesterday. I pray your blessing upon our reading and our study here this morning. Bless us as we read chapter 12. Give us wisdom and insight from it. I pray you'll give us some things that'll be helpful to our lives. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you, and we ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. All right, 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse number 1. And Samuel said unto all Israel, Behold, I have hearkened unto your voice in all that ye said unto me, and have made a king over you. So Samuel is not taking responsibility for the king. He is blaming the people for the king. And he's not blaming so much as saying, hey, you know what? Uh, you asked for a king. I did what you asked. I gave you what you wanted. Verse two, and now behold, the king walketh before you. And I am old and gray headed and behold, my sons are with you. And I have walked before you from my childhood unto this day. Behold, here I am, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken, or whose ass have I taken, or whom have I defrauded, whom have I oppressed, or of whose hand have I received any bribe to blind mine eyes therewith, and I will restore it to you. He says, here's what I want you people to do. I want you to think long and hard. Have I taken any property that belongs to any of you? Have I taken any livestock that belongs to any of you? Have I defrauded any of you? Have I accepted a bribe against you? Speak now. Be a witness before the Lord against me. Tell me if I've done any of these things. And I will make sure that I restore to you the things that you claim I've taken. Verse 4. And they said, Thou hast not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. And he said unto them, The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day, that ye have not found aught in my hand. And they answered, He is witness. So after asking them, did I do anything wrong? Did I take anything from you? Did I accept any bribes? Did I defraud any of you? 
the whole people say, no, you've never done anything like that. You've never done anything wrong. You are blameless, which by the way, is a qualification of a pastor of a New Testament church in 1 Timothy 3. Uh, in fact, it's the very first one. A bishop must then be blameless. You can't point your finger at any pastor and say, you did this to me. Now, if you can, then he's not blameless and he's not qualified to lead. But when you, that's, that's something the pastors to live up to. This is what Samuel lived up to as the prophet. So from a young boy, remember, he was four or five years old when he started serving in the temple with Eli. Now he describes himself as old and gray-headed. So we don't know exactly how old he is necessarily. At least I've never looked into it. But uh, he's lived his whole life serving God and serving these people. And he's done so blamelessly. So what he's doing is he's establishing his reputation as someone who's on the side of the people. He's not fought them, he's not been against them, and he's not taken advantage of them. He's loved them and he's been for them. And so now he's going to say his piece, making clear that they understand it's someone who's been on their side that's about to say all that he's about to say. By the way, before we leave this, let's talk about the importance of a good reputation. You know, when people hear your name, they think something. They think either good or they think bad. They think either what you've done for them and how you've, you've handled yourself and treated others, or they think of how you mistreated them and done wrong by them. Now, to be fair, you can have a good reputation and have done right and people still criticize you. Uh, you know, you look at the enemies that Paul had as he writes these epistles and he mentions uh, Diotrephes and other individuals like that who turned on him. I guarantee you those people didn't have good things to say about Paul. And so you're going to get the naysayers out there, but by and large, your reputation among the right kind of people should be a positive one. Verse 6, and Samuel said unto the people, It is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron, and that brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. So he's going to give a real brief history lesson of the Israelites. Jacob goes up to Egypt with Joseph, and then 400 years pass as they become enslaved. God sends Moses and Aaron to de deliver them. Verse 7, Now therefore stand still that I may reason with you before the Lord of all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and to your fathers. So he's basically, that verse says, listen to me. I'm going to tell you what God's done. When Jacob was come into Egypt and your fathers cried unto the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, which brought forth your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. And when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the, land, in the hand of Sisera, captain of the host of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. And they cried unto the Lord and said, We have sinned, because we have forsaken the Lord, and have served Balaam and Ashtaroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies, and we will serve thee. So he says, when Moses and Aaron brought you out of Egypt and they established you, you began to sin against God and you turned away from him and you served Balaam and Ashtaroth, these false gods. And when, God, when you did that, God said, okay, you guys have to learn a lesson. When you're with me, I protect you and bless you. When you walk away from me, I leave you to the will of your enemies. And so Sisera the Philistines and others that are mentioned here, uh, the Moabites, I think, were listed. They, they get victory over the Israelites. And as they're being defeated, Israel always comes to themselves and says, boy, why did we leave the hand of God? Why did we walk away from him? Why did we abandon his presence? And they return to the Lord. And that's a cycle we see, right? Things are good in Israel. They turn their back on God. Their enemies start to oppress them. And uh, they can't take it anymore. So they come back to God. And he begins to bless them again. And once everything gets good, then they start to the cycle all over again. Round and round she goes. Verse number 11. And the Lord sent Jerubbabel and Bedan, and Jephthah, and Samuel, and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, 
and ye dwelled safe. And so these are the prophets that are given to the people that lead them back to God. And when they obeyed those prophets, and he includes himself in here, then God puts his hand a blessing on them again. Verse 12, And when ye saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came against you, ye said unto me, Nay, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. And so now he's going to really bring this home for them to understand. So, you know, this, this group of people came at you and you said, we want a human king. We're tired of having uh, God as our, our leader. It's, it's laughable to think that they'd say that. And, uh, but they want a king. Uh, when God was your king. Now, therefore, behold the king whom ye have chosen and whom ye have desired. And behold, the Lord hath set a king over you. So this is what he's saying in verse 13. You wanted a king, God gave you a king. You got what you wanted. And this is, he's, he's reinforcing this point because he's trying to explain to them that this isn't going to solve all their problems. You know, we, we sometimes think, man, if I could just have this one thing, all my problems would be solved. It's not true. Just having one thing isn't going to solve your problems. It doesn't work that way. And he's telling them, just because you have a human king now, don't think all your problems are going to be solved. Because truly, they're their own problem. They're the worst of their own problems. And so he's trying to get them to understand, just because you switched from following God to this human things aren't going to get better for you. In fact, why would they get better to abandon the Lord and serve a man? Verse 14. So here is the encouragement that he's giving them. If ye will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. So he says, if you set out to seek and follow God, then you and your king will be moving in that direction. Verse 15, but if ye will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your fathers. So basically saying, look, nothing's changed. Just because you have this king, it's the same thing. If you follow God, he'll bless you. And if you reject him, he won't. Verse 16. Now, therefore, stand and see this great thing, which the Lord will do before your eyes. Verse 17, is it not wheat harvest today? I will call unto the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain, that ye may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which ye have done in the sight of the Lord in asking you a king. So Samuel's telling them what you asked for in a human king was a great wickedness. Remember what God said in, pardon me, I think chapter 11, maybe 10, no, maybe 9. Don't worry about it, Samuel. They've not rejected you. They've rejected me. Can you imagine that? They've rejected me. And so that's all right. I'm going to give them what they want. You know, you look at how God handles the way his people treat him the maturity, and I know that's a ridiculous word because I'm speaking of the Lord himself, but what I'm getting at is the, the lessons you and I should learn from the way God handles mistreatment. You know, God is the Almighty. He is God, uh, but he is mistreated. And when he is mistreated, he could respond any way he wanted to, and he would be just in doing so. But he, he, he handles himself very differently than sometimes you and I do. How do you respond when you're mistreated by people? Do you lash out? Do you give the silent treatment? Do you distance yourself? Do you pout? What do you do? Here God says, you know what? They've rejected me. But that's okay. I'm going to give them what they want. And they'll learn in time that it wasn't the best thing for them. So he uh, he's telling him here, we're, it's the it's the day to start harvesting wheat. And you know what I'm going to tell God to do or ask God to do? Bring a thunderstorm that rains so hard you can't get in your fields. 
And I'm doing this to show you how wicked you were in asking for a king. So God doesn't retaliate against the people, but Samuel kind of does, doesn't he? Verse 18, so Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thun thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. So he told them, you're going to see a thunderstorm today like you've never seen before. And it's going to be a judgment for your wickedness. And so God, please bring the rain. And God does. And the people are, whoa, God is real. Samuel is no joke. We need to make sure that we act right. Verse 19, and all the people said unto Samuel, pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God that we die not. For we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. So they asked God or asked Samuel, please pray to God that he doesn't kill us. Pray the Lord that he'd spare us because we have done evil in asking a king. So now they realize they shouldn't have insisted and they shouldn't have forced God to give them this king. Verse 20, and Samuel said unto the people, fear not, ye have done all this wickedness. Yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. He says, you know, you have done wickedly, but come back to God. And you know, that's always the option. That's always God's desire. He understands that you're wicked. He understands I'm wicked and ungodly. And we blow it. And sometimes we blow it daily. And sometimes we keep blowing it in the same ways we've blown it in the past. And God says, you know what? Come back to me. Fear not. I'll receive you. My mercies are new every morning. Let's start the day out together. And let's do this thing together. Verse number 21. And turn ye not aside, for then should ye go after vain things, which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. What Samuel's saying here is any life that's not a life lived under the Lord is vain. It's empty. It's shallow. Verse 22, for the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. So God will never forsake those that are his. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he hath done for you. Well, that's a good verse to take through the day to day, isn't it? Why don't you consider today the great things God has done for you? Verse 25, but if ye shall still do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. So if you decide to not follow the Lord, to turn your back on him again, he will consume you, he will destroy you, and that piddly little king that you demanded to have from him. All right, that's chapter number 12. Uh, Samuel got his say in, didn't he? And, and by the way, what's he doing here? I don't think he's trying to just get vengeance on the people for rejecting the Lord and, and rejecting his advice. He's He's truly wants the best for the people. And that's what any godly leader wants. Godly leaders want what's best for the people, not just uh, not just trying to benefit himself, like Hophni and Phinehas or Eli or the sons of Samuel even, as they were uh, greedy of lucre and, and took bribes and perverted judgment. God, uh, good leaders want what's best for the people, and that's what they're trying to do. That's what Samuel's trying to do for the people of Israel here. All right, we'll pick it up there tomorrow. Man, I felt good to be back home in the office right on time at 10 o'clock. Thanks for watching this morning. As always, like, love, share the post, please. Get the word out there. A little bit rainy in our area here today, but hopefully you can find something productive to do for the Lord. God bless you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow morning.